reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 11, entitled Lord Krishna's Entrance into Dwaraka. This is text number 27. Sita tapatra vyagne upaskrita. Sita tapatra vyagne upaskrita. Prasun navarsher abhivarshita pati. Prasun navarsher abhivarshita pati. Pishangavasha vanamalaya babu. Pishangavasha vanamalaya babu. Gano yata yatarku dupachapa vaidyute. Gano yatarku dupachapa vaidyute. Sitartha Patra Vyagne Rupaskritai Prasunna Varsher Abhivarshita Pati Pishangavasa Vanamalaya Babu Gano Yatarko Dupachapa Vaidyate Sita Patra White Umbrella Vyagne with a Chamara fan Upaskrita being served by Prasanna Flowers Varsher by the showers Abhivarshita thus being covered Patihi on the road, Pishangavasa by the yellow garments, Vanamalaya by the flower garlands, Babhau thus it became, Ghanaha cloud, Yata as if, Arka the sun, Udupa the moon, Chapa, the rainbow, Vaidyutai, by the lightning. Translation, as the Lord passed along the public road of Dwarka, his head was protected from the sunshine by a white umbrella. White feathered fans moved in semicircles 
and showers of flowers fell upon the road. His yellow garments and garlands of flowers made it appear as if a dark cloud were surrounded simultaneously by sun, moon, lightning and rainbows. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shila Prabhupada. The sun, moon, rainbow and lightning do not appear in the sky simultaneously. When there is sun, the moonlight becomes insignificant. And if there are clouds and a rainbow, there is no manifestation of lightning. The Lord's bodily hue is just like a new monsoon cloud. He is compared herein to the cloud. The white umbrella over his head is compared to the sun. The movement of the bunch of hair fan of flukes is compared to the moon. The showers of flowers are compared to the stars. His yellow garments are compared to the rainbow. So all these activities of the firmament being impossible simultaneous factors cannot be adjusted by comparison. The adjustment is possible only when we think of the inconceivable potency of the Lord. The Lord in all, is all powerful and in His presence Anything impossible can be made possible by his inconceivable energy. But the situation created at the time of his passing on the roads of Dwaraka was beautiful and could not be compared to anything beside the description of the natural phenomena. Omakyanti mirandasya gyananjana shalakaya chakshuron militam yena tasmai shri gurave namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bishtam Sapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Utaha Padakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnamamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Ragunatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadhutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakan Vitamscha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrinda Vaneshwari Urishabhano Shute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vanchakal Pataru Vyascha Kripasendo Bevacha Patitanam Pavane Bio Vaishnavibio Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadigar Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna. In this particular beautiful verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam, we are going to be focusing on two very important and very relevant aspects of these of this verse. The one thing I'm going to focus on is uh, in the description there is a mention of the chamar, the the white yak fan of the Lord. So I would like to share a very interesting story about how the Chamar came to be one of the paraphernalias of the Lord. And then uh, I'll go on to focus on one other aspect of this verse which is on the word impossible. How impossible things become possible when the Lord is there in, the, in, in between. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today. So, um, the, there is a very interesting story of um, 
Badri Vishal from Badrinath Dham, which uh, brings out the glory of the yak tail. Why that particular yak tail is used to worship the Lord. So there was a particular point in time where uh, Lord Badrinath uh, used to be worshipped not exactly in Badri Visha, in Badrinath Kshetra, but a little away in a small part of Tibet actually, which was called as um, um, Tolinga Mat. So this was a Tibetan monastery. Obviously, this was much before Buddha. So those monks also were Vaishnavas only. So Badri Vishal was in that Tibetan monastery uh, being worshipped by the Lamas over there. So he was very happy with the worship. But at a particular point in time, the Lamas got converted to Buddhism. And when they got converted to Buddhism, they naturally you know, neglected the worship of Badri Vishal. And they started you know, doing meditation and stuff like that. And of course, over a period of time, even Buddhism, the way it is, way Lord Buddha introduced it, got perverted. And then they started doing whatever they wanted. You know, they, start, they started eating meat, though Buddha originally came for Ahimsa. Badri Vishal was not comfortable in uh, Tolingamat. And he decided, I, don't, I want to get out from here. Now, you know, he is in Tibet and he wants to come back to his house in uh, Badri, Badri, uh, Badri Shetra. How does he come back? So he found a way of getting out of that place first. He was so frustrated. You know, sometimes we, are, we all human beings do get frustrated time to time. But uh, the Lord gets even more frustrated. And when the Lord gets frustrated, his frustration also is another level, basically. He got so frustrated that he shot out of the Tolingamat's uh, roof. In Hindi we say, Chappar Farke Nikal Gaya, na? He actually shot out of the roof, you know. And they became a big hole in the roof. So even today, if you go to Tolingamat in Tibet, there is a hole in the roof from where the Badri Vishal got out. In fact, what, the, what they have done is, they have made a huge deity of Badri Vishal, or sorry, not of Badri Vishal, of Buddha, in place of Badri Vishal. And that deity of Buddha is so big, the head of the deity comes out of that hole, basically. And they made a double floor on top of it. So, Badri Vishal got out from the from Tolingamat and he was looking for a way to reach uh, his eternal abode. And he found a horse. So, this horse had a black ear and a white body, full white body horse, the black ear. It is called a Shamkarna horse. And Badri Vishal got on that horse and came, you know, um, riding the horse to Badri Shetra. And in the meanwhile, the Lamas of Tolingamat, they were looking for Badri Vishal. And they, didn't, they found him missing, so they began to chase the horse. And somehow they reached the Badri Shetra, where Badrinath got off. When the deity got off the horse, Badri Vishal, where he landed, there is a um, footprint of the Lord, even now in, on the Badrinath mountains. But then the Lord saw Lamas coming looking for him, so he got scared that they are going to take him back. So he was looking for a place to hide himself, to save himself from the Lamas. And while he was looking for a place to hide himself, that time he saw one yak roaming around, you know. And if you, I don't know if, how many of you have seen a yak. Yaks are very furry animals. Especially the back side of the yak is very, very furry, you know. So what Badri Vishal did, he reduced his size and went and hid in the fur of the yaks. So these Lamas went and searched everywhere. They couldn't find him. They went back home. And Badri Vishal was so grateful to the Yaks for saving him from the Lamas that he declared, from today onwards, this feather of the Yaks will be used to worship me. That is how the Yak feather is used even today. You know, when we do Chamar, one time the Yak had helped Badri Vishal ages, thousands of years back, but the gratitude that the Lord has he is repaying it even today by using that chamar uh, for his worship. So when I was reading this 
particular part of the chamar so i thought i should narrate this story i found this story fascinating and i found this story so interesting you know and obviously we we use a chamar on a daily basis but many times we don't even know that such a story exists um now i want to focus on the word impossible so here um propa is bringing out this thought that the impossible becomes possible when the lord is there so for the lord anything impossible is also possible so now I, as i was meditating on this particular uh, thought of impossible becoming, becoming possible i was thinking what is the impossible that is being spoken about here of course there are many things that are impossible that the lord can make we can focus on all the magic in the creation we can focus on so many things that are mystical that the lord can do and so many amazing past times the virat roop and all that but i don't want to focus on all those aspects which are Im- impossible i want to focus on something that is humanly impossible you know what is the most impossible thing for two human beings to actually do the most impossible thing for two human beings is to agree on each other's opinions when two human beings have two different opinions it is Im- almost impossible that they will say yes what you are saying is right what i am saying is wrong it is impossible when two people have two contrasting opinions to make them agree is impossible and i am going to tell you all two stories one from the ramayan and one from the mahabharat of how the lord made impossible possible and interestingly these are stories of devotees of the lord both the parties are devotees but they still not agreeing on something so we can't say of course if there is a fight between a demon and a devotee it's a different story but if there is fight between two devotees it's a totally different story so here are two amazing stories of how uh, the lord intervened between uh, two devotees who are having two different opinions and brought them together um in the ramayan we find when um, lord ram was on the shore of the ocean and um, you know he was deciding how to cross the ocean at that point in time uh, ram asks vibhishan what is your idea how do i cross this ocean vibhishan says the ocean is um created by your ancestors sagar maharaj he is the one who created the ocean the word sagar comes from the word sagar so sagar maharaj is the one who created the ocean so the ocean has some gratitude towards you because his creation is connected to your ancestry so vibhishan said my opinion is you please pray to the ocean god for 3 days and you know 3 4 days you spend praying to the ocean god and i'm sure he will agree to help you ram turns towards lakshman and asks him what do you think we should do lakshman said are you forget praying and all that take your bow and arrow drive up the ocean now see two different opinions given by two different devotees one is the brother of the enemy and one is his own brother whose whose opinion should he listen to ideally your own brother's opinion is more important than the bro- enemy's brother right vibhishan is enemy's brother so ideally ram should have listened to vibhishan uh, to lakshman because how do you trust vibhishan he just joined five minutes back he took sharanagati in five minutes how can you have so much trust that you take his opinion more seriously than your own brother's opinion but ram is here to build bridges so before ram built the bridge across the ocean of stone he built a bridge between vibhishan and lakshman usually human beings are experts at building walls we are all experts at building walls but we don't know how to build bridges but the the lord is so amazing that he is expert in building bridges so what lord ram tells vibhishan and lakshman he tells them that i will listen to both of you all 
And this is amazing that the Lord never sides one person. He always takes both opinions seriously. Whether, you know, you both agree or no, but the Lord agrees to both, basically. The Lord tells Vibhishan, I will first listen to your opinion for three days. I will meditate on the ocean god for three days. If the ocean god doesn't come, then I will follow Lakshman's opinion and take the bow and arrow. So he reconciled both the opinions and he built a bridge between the two of them. Usually, any kind of conflict resolution that takes place, after the conflict resolution, still the conflict continues in the heart. Physically, yes, people may seem to have come together. But internally, people still are at war. And the proof that Ram actually managed to build the bridge between the two is this. When the Ra Ram-Ravan war was happening, at one point of time, Ravan threw a weapon at Vibhishan. And when Ravan threw the weapon at Vibhishan, Lakshman came in between and took the weapon in his heart. So that means, so if imagine if Lakshman still carried the grudge in his heart, against Vibhishan, he would have said, Chalo, let him go, no problem. Eh, na? But Lakshman actually felt good that Ram reconciled the, the gap between us. So Ram didn't build wall between Lakshman and Vibhishan. What he did? He built a bridge. In the Mahabharat, we find something very similar happening, where during the war, um, Arjun, Yudhishthir Maharaj had been hurt very badly by Karna. And he was so hurt physically, emotionally, mentally, that he was brought back to the camp by his chariot driver. And uh, Arjun comes to find out if, if uh, Yudhishthir is alright. But Yudhishthir had expectation that Arjun would have come after killing Karna. So as soon as Arjun entered the camp, Yudhishthir asked him, have you killed Karna? Arjun said, no, I have not killed him. And Yudhishthira started blasting Arjun. He started saying, you are useless. I should not have had faith in you only. I should have had faith in Nakul Sahadev. They probably would have done something that you, you couldn't do. And he said, imagine, this is Yudhishthira speaking. He said, I wish our mother had killed you while you were in the womb only. When you were five months in the womb, she should have killed you. I don't know why our mother allowed you to be born. She's, he said, your Gandiva is a piece of stick. Just throw it. Now when Arjun heard all this, he lost his cool. He took out his sword and went to kill Yudhishthir. And Krishna was standing there. Now as I said, the role of the Lord is to build bridges, you know. He's seeing two devotees. Arjun, wonderful devotee. Yudhishthir, wonderful devotee. But both of them are actually out here to destroy each other, kill each other. Arjun removed a sword, he went to kill Yudhishthir. Krishna asked him, wait a minute. Five minutes back, you came to see if he's alright. Why are you going to kill him now? Arjun said, see, I have taken a vow that if anybody tells me to throw my Gandiva, I'll kill that person. So now Krishna said, don't worry, I'll give you a solution. He said, according to the scriptures, if a younger person insults an older person, it is as good as killing him. He said, you insult him, it is as good as killing Yudhishthir. And then Arjun started blasting Yudhishthir like anything. He said, all our problems in life is happening because of you only. If you were not attached to gambling, we would not have been so unhappy. Blasted him left, right, center. After blasting Yudhishthir, Arjun felt so bad that I insulted my own elder brother. He removed the sword, he wanted to kill, him, kill himself. Krishna asked him, now what happened? So Arjun said, how can I live after insulting my older brother like this? Krishna said, don't worry, there is a solution for that also. You know? If you glorify yourself, Self-praise is as good as suicide. You know, nowadays, social media is all about suicide attempts. Every day, people are glorifying themselves only. <laughs> so, Arjun started glorifying himself. He said, I am Gandhi Vadhari, I have defeated Shiva, I have defeated Indra. Went on profusely glorifying himself. And then finally, Arjun and Yudhishthir settled down and they both fell at Krishna's feet. And then Krishna gave them some amazing sutras of life. This is the way Krishna bridges gaps. He makes opinions which are contrasting, different. He reconciles and helps people build bridges instead of building walls. A conflict like this ideally should have created a rift between Yudhishthira and Arjuna forever. But it didn't because of Krishna's present. Krishna told Arjuna and Yudhishthira two stories. 
He said, what you are seeing is from your point of view, you are right. And what he is seeing from his point of view, he is right. So ideally, when you see from your point of view, but you don't see from the other person's point of view, you will always make mistakes. And Krishna says, what is right is not necessarily right, it may be wrong also. And what is wrong may not necessarily be wrong, it may be right also. And saying this, Krishna told them two stories. The first story he told of a hunter named Valaka. This hunter was roaming around in the forest once and uh, he shot an arrow and killed an animal. When the hunter went close to the animal, he realized the animal was blind. According to hunting profession, a hunter is not supposed to kill a blind animal. That is the rule. So he felt so bad that he had committed a sin of killing a blind animal. And while this hunter was repenting so much, at that point, uh, some of the sages come and tell the hunter, no, don't worry, you're not wrong. Because this is not an animal, it's a demon that is disguised as an animal. So apparently, he seemed to have done something wrong, but it's actually not wrong, it's right. And then Krishna tells, tells them another story. He tells the story of a sage named Kaushika. He says, there was a sage named Kaushika and this sage was um, meditating outside his ashram once and a man came running to this sage and this man was like, you know, almost uh, on the verge of uh, fainting, just running away from someone desperately. This man came and he said, there are four decoids chasing me and they are out here to kill me. Can you please allow me to hide in your ashram and just don't tell them that I am here. Please save my life. He went and hid. And then the decoids came after some time. The decoids saw this Kaushika sitting here. They asked Kaushika, did you see somebody go? Did you see a man come here? Now this Kaushika was in a dilemma because he had taken a lifelong vow of speaking the truth always. Never speak a lie. And here, he had to decide. If he had to save this fellow's life, he had to tell a lie. But if he had to tell the truth, then this fellow's life will, you know, be in trouble. Kaushik was very confused. Finally, he said, truth is more important than anything else. He told them the truth. And the, the decoids went in, slaughtered that man in his ashram only. So Krishna tells this story and tells Arjun and uh, uh, Yudhishthir, that apparently this Kaushika did the right thing by speaking the truth, according to him. But right that leads to violence, that leads to so much of suffering, is not right, it's wrong. Arjuna and Yudhishthira were amazed how my opinion, though it seems to be absolutely justified according to me, it may not be right. According to a higher truth, it may be wrong. And somebody else's statement which may appear to me, be, to me to be wrong may actually be right from a higher perspective. And Krishna helped them understand how looking at the other person's perspective is as important, if not more, than just focusing on your perspective and your version of what is right and what is wrong. This ability to um, reconcile is something that all of us have to really struggle to learn. Because in our own personal life situations, we realize that we are always so hell-bent on our opinions, uh, our feelings of what is right and wrong, that we don't care only about other people's feelings and other people's opinions, uh, other people's thoughts. Reconciling both sides and seeing what is true from a neutral perspective is something that we can learn from Krishna and Ram. So many stories from the scriptures of how the intervention of the Lord helps to reconcile. Like for example, Vashishta, the great sage, Vishwamitra, another great sage. Now, imagine if Vashishta and Vishwamitra they, they cannot be a better example than these two sages. Both of them, Saptarishis. Both of them, pure devotees of the Lord. 
but not agreeing to each other's opinions. Now, who are you and me? <laughs> so, if, if within a, in a ISKCON setup, within a small setup, if two devotees say, I don't agree with what you're saying, you don't agree with what I say, are if Vashishtha and Vishwamitra didn't agree to each other, who are you and me? But the amazing thing is, what helped them understand is when Ram came in the picture. So, both of them worshipped Ram. To them, Ram represented the bridge to cross over the worldly ocean. So, um, symbolically, the idea of a bridge is something that, um, you know, bridge is one of the best means of crossing over an ocean, isn't it? Uh, if, you, if you have to cross over an ocean, you can swim across the ocean, almost impossible for most people. Or you can take a boat across the ocean, very, very tedious and very, very difficult, you know, process. But if there's a bridge across the ocean, it is so easy to cross. So, when, um, when we have a vast ocean, usually between two people, what really develops is a very vast ocean. Um, especially when two people disagree on something. And when two people uh, are very hell-bent on what they feel is right. It becomes a very vast ocean. So, Vishwamitra and Vashishta, I mean, it is almost like Tom and Jerry's story, you know, the original version of it, you know. Literally out there to kill each other. Their opinions not just mattered from a point of view of just opinion, they were ready to wipe out the other person to make their opinion true, basically. That is the extent to which they were having a difference and fight. So, um, and the extent of their fight was so much. Like, for example, um, of all, th there are many incidents that happen in Vashishta Vishwamitra's story. I don't want to get into that. But I'll just focus on one aspect of Vashishta Vishwamitra's difference. Vashishta focused heavily on Daivavad. Daivavad means rules set by God are to be followed as they are. Everything in life is determined by God only. That is known as Daivavad. There are a lot of people who strongly believe in Daivavad. But Vishwamitra had believed in Karmavad. He said, I will change everything. By my effort, I'll change everything. I am a king, but I'll become a rishi. I'll become a sage. A sheer dint of his effort, Vishwamitra actually became a Brahma Rishi. So, there was a point where there was a guy called Trishanku that came in between the two of them. The Trishanku was a king of Ayodhya. Trishanku went to Vashishta first and he said, I want to go to heaven in the same body. Vashishta said, you are a fool. Where is the rule? The rule says that after you die, you do good uh, pious credits. If you deserve it, you will go to heaven. That is a rule. That is Daivavad. Trishanku went to Vishwamitra and said, this is what Vashishta is saying. Vishwamitra said, if Vashishta is saying like this, I will prove it is wrong. You know, Trishanku was a smart guy. Very, very uh, good in psychology, understanding human psychology. He understood between Vashishta and Vishwamitra, there is some rada. You know, there is something seriously wrong between them. So, Trishanku said, let me take advantage of this. He went between them and he instigated Vashishta first. Then he went and instigated Vishwamitra. Vishwamitra said, I will send you back. I will send you to heaven in the same body. Come. Vishwamitra put his full effort, full energy. He put all the power of his tapasya to send this guy to heaven in the same body. But uh, after the yagya also, nothing really happened. His yagya was a failure, ma massive failure. So now, for Vishwamitra, it became an ego issue. He felt that Vashishta is laughing at me. So he invested his entire tapabal. He sacrificed everything he had and made this fellow fly. So, Trishanku was literally flying to the heaven, you know. Literally, in the same body, he was flying to the heaven. Now, Trishanku became happy. He didn't have to do anything. He only had to do, you know, instigate two people. And he's getting to go for free. So, as Trishanku went up, you know, this is completely against Devavad, right? So, Indra intervened and sent Trishanku back down. So, Vishwamitra sent him back up. Trishindra sent him back down. He became like a shuttlecock, you know. Two powerful people batting with him. Now, Trishanku said, forget it, I don't want to go to heaven, I want to come back. 
for now for vishwamitra it was not about his opinion now it is about his to prove his you know strength he said i'm going to send you anyhow so finally when vishwamitra realized that i can't send him to heaven vishwamitra said i'll create a parallel heaven it's like this you know you shoot bulls eye if the arrow falls here and there wherever the arrow hits you go and draw bulls eye over there you know so vishwamitra said i'm going to make a parallel heaven so he used all his tapobal created a parallel heaven so till this point in time karma vada was working apparently you know so everybody was amazed how the karma vada is working so perfectly that's when the problem was actually began so when he put him in that parallel heaven vishwamitra created parallel demigods 33 crore demigods he created imagine is a parallel heaven and after trishanka entered over there um you know vishwamitra's power was over he created the heaven but to maintain the heaven he had no strength and that's when vishwamitra loudly shouted out the name of vishnu and as soon as uh, vishwamitra loudly took the name of vishnu lord vishnu appeared and told vishwamitra don't worry you created the heaven now you can't handle it i will take care of it and he told vishwamitra the only thing is trishanku can stay in this heaven but because indra sent him upside down he will stay in the heaven upside down so trishanku got heaven also but not exactly the original heaven but he got another parallel heaven but he can't stay upside he can't stay straight over there he has to stay upside down you know that's why this trishanku example is given many of us some people who are neither here nor there somewhere hanging in between you know they call trishankus so here in this story we find something amazing the lord he reconciled two opinions here karmavad means i will do everything daivavad means god will do everything but here what the lord did he reconciled the two which is what bhakti is all about right bhakti means you put your effort after you put your effort you get out from there then the grace the lord the lord's grace will have to follow it's if everything happens according to my effort only then i become god the fact that everything cannot happen only by my effort i will need to depend on the lord that fact helps us become humble grounded and that's where the lord steps in to reconcile the lord could have easily said forget this is heaven and why did you create something that i didn't create the lord didn't do that he respected vishwamitra's effort also but at the same time vashishta's opinion about rules and regulations the idea that you know god's uh, laws are important even that the lord didn't let go he kept that also and when he reconciled the two that's when they actually started looking at life from a different perspective that was the first time in vishwamitra's life he understood there is something beyond me beyond my ability beyond my power that is important and finally when vishwamitra he became a brahma rishi you know brahma ji came and declared that you are a brahma rishi so vishwamitra said no 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 not enough that you declare i want vashishta to come and declare so far brahma ji went and called vashishta he said you only declare baba that this person is brahma rishi now so vashishta declared now you are a brahma rishi immediately after that vishwamitra did something amazing he fell at the feet of vashishta he actually fell at the feet of vashishta and he begged forgiveness for everything that he had done to vashishta now how did that realization come to vishwamitra muni the realization came because vishwamitra realized that vashishta was a brahma rishi from such a long period of time and to become a brahma rishi all the effort that i had taken i know what what kind of effort thousands of years of effort that means vashishta has already done all that and he has become a brahma rishi for thousands of years before and vishwamitra that is when he started realizing the greatness of of vashishta till this point of time he was only realizing his own greatness so the the moment you come to a point where you realize that there is a small um factor that is much beyond you but beyond your effort that's when you start realizing that i need to reconcile this other factor coming in picture and after uh, vishwamitra fell at vashishta's feet and took shelter of vashishta he had one thought his thought was vashishta is such a great brahma rishi but why is he sitting in ayodhya for such a long period of time 
Ideally, Vashishta would have an ashram in the forest with very few disciples. But for a prolonged period of time, Vashishta is sitting in Ayodhya and become a Rajguru over there. So Vishwamitra started thinking, why is Vashishta sitting in Ayodhya and becoming a Rajguru? There must be something because of which he is doing that. And that's when he realized there is Ram who is going to appear there. And Ram is that factor because of which Vashishta is sitting there. And the moment Vishwamitra realized that Ram, Vashishta is sitting there because of Ram to take shelter of Lord Ram, he said, I also should go there only. And that is how Vishwamitra makes this whole plan of coming you know, uh, to Ayodhya and taking shelter of Lord Ram, taking Ram away with him to the forest for a, for a few months. So, um, two bricks. Now, if you have seen a wall or any kind of structure being made, the structure is made of bricks, isn't it? But when bricks are kept one after another, one on top of another, does it become a sturdy wall? No. You just push one brick, the whole wall falls down. But between the two bricks, if you put a cement layer, and that cement layer dries up, and that really holds the bricks together, isn't it? So similarly, two devotees, strong-headed, powerful, intense opinions of their own. They are like two bricks. And it is impossible to create a temple or create any kind of organizational structure with only bricks being put together. What it really needs is that fine layer of cement that can hold the bricks together. And that's where the Lord comes in. The, the role of the Lord. So our society is a society of Krishna consciousness. To the extent we are conscious of Krishna, to that extent that cementing factor is strong. To the, to the extent we are conscious of our own selves, my opinion, my interests, my desires, to that extent it becomes like a bricks, bricks together without that cementing factor. And here we are finding in this particular story about how the Lord can do impossible things provided we allow him to remain in between. Provided we allow him to do that role of building bridges and not building walls. Unfortunately, we use all that cement to build walls between us rather than actually creating bridges between us. So let us um, take shelter of the Lord, um, understanding the fact that he can do impossible things. You know, Srila Prabhupada defines a Muni in, her, in the Gita as two people who never agree to each other. Interesting, you know. Very knowledgeable people, but they never agree to each other's opinion. That's the definition of Muni. You know, interestingly, in Iskand, we have many, many knowledgeable people, many, many Munis. Uh, to get all the Munis to agree to each other is like almost impossible. And that's where Krishna comes in picture. And hopefully the Munis can function together and create a beautiful society. Hare Krishna. Grantra Shimad Bhagavatam ki, Shila Prabhupada ki jai.